Coming up on Main Challenge, author, historian, and professor Heather Cox Richardson. Welcome to a special edition of Maine Challenge. We're joined today by author and historian Heather Cox Richardson. Her sixth book, How the South Won the Civil War, Oligarchy, Democracy, and the Continu Continuing Fight for the Soul of America, was published in March of 2020. Welcome to Maine Challenge, Professor Richardson. Oh, it's such a pleasure to be here. What exciting times we're living in, huh? Well, that's true. It's not, it's not boring. Uh, the first question is obviously, why couldn't you have made the title of your book any longer? <laughs> well, you know what's funny about that is that when, when people write books, they have a working title. And um, that was the working title. And it was, I did not write it. It was written by a colleague of mine who's very good at writing titles. And I never expected that the book would have that name. And the galleys came through with that name. And I called the editor and said, no, no, what are we really going to name the book? And he's like, well, I love it. And so then it went forward like that. And I'm like, wait, wait, that was kind of like my way of getting up in the morning. It wasn't supposed to end up on the book itself. <laughs> well, the only time it's a problem is when some amateur dodo like me has to spell it out, word it out. Um, I wanted to get to some of the issues. Uh, I know you have a warm spot in your heart for the state of Maine. And uh, everybody in our viewing area, I think, is paying close attention to the U.S. Senate race, especially in the state of Maine, which, as you know, is pitting Sarah Gideon against uh, Senator Susan Collins, four-term senator running for her fifth, and two others who I guess I should mention, Max Lynn and Lisa Savage. Uh, any thoughts on that race from your perspective? Yes, and you have to remember that um, I do, in fact, have a very soft spot in my heart for Maine. But that being said, I tend to look at things from a national perspective. And one of the things that makes this race so exciting, I think for people here as well as for people nationally, is that you know, Maine really has the opportunity to determine the future of the country because the direction of the Senate could very well be determined here, whether or not the Democrats get a majority with Sarah Gideon or whether, in fact, they're going to continue to have Mitch McConnell at the head of the, the uh, majority leadership in the Senate if they reelect Susan Collins. And so there is, I think there's this moment when your vote has always mattered, but this moment, you know, as Maine goes, really so does go the nation, as they used to say in the 19th century. Wow. Uh, do you, uh, how, how much faith do you have in the, in the polling that we see? So I actually have a lot of faith in polling. And let me explain why I just saw your eyebrows go up. And, and let me explain why I think polling matters. And that's that um, pollsters are actually really good. I mean, they're really, some of them are just partisan polls and they're designed to change the political narrative and those you can dismiss. But the aggregate polls, the ones that are gonna be aggregated by major newspapers or by 538 or by any of the places that one looks tend to be really, really good. And they matter because what they tell us is how Americans as a whole are thinking about certain issues and not simply about the election, but also about all kinds of issues. I mean, they basically poll how many, you know, flakes per stomach of cereal you put, you know, in your mouth every morning. I mean, they, they, they poll everything. But why that matters for a political contest is that our electoral system does not, in fact, reflect the way people are thinking because of the bastardization of the electoral college. And, and that, that, was, that doesn't operate now the way it was designed to operate. So we don't get necessarily in the presidency the person who's won the popular vote or the person who actually reflects what people want. We get that from pollsters. And that is, I think, a really important thing for people to keep in mind because pollsters can say, hey, listen, even though the electoral vote went for this candidate. In fact, if you actually look at what people want, they actually wanted this and these policies. And I think it's a really important check on what we understand about, um, you know, what we understand about political beliefs. The, uh, the polling, it seems to me more so than four years ago or six years ago when Collins ran before, uh, the polling seems to be very consistent. It's not uh, as 
all over the place. You can always, you used to be able to always find a poll that suited your point of view. And it seems like, especially in the presidential race, that Biden seems to have maintained the same kind of lead. And of course, when we got to election night in 2016, we all were, or many of us were dumbfounded over the outcome. And uh, I'm wondering if the polling has gotten better or if we're getting told the same joke, but we haven't figured out it's got the same punchline. Well, the polling has gotten better in that they are weighting the polls better than they were before. They didn't take into consideration some of the factors that turned out to matter a lot, like whether or not you had a college degree in 2016. Now they're waiting for that. So there is a sense that these polls are more accurate. And if you look, some of the pollsters actually have, this is where we think things are now. This is what we would have said in 2016. So there is that, but there is one important caveat to polls, and that is that they give you a really good snapshot of what the world was like a week to 10 days ago. And what that means is they can't factor in last minute changes and they can't, and that means, for example, in 2016, they didn't factor in or they couldn't factor in the Comey letter, you know, James Comey coming out just before an election and saying, oh yes, we are reopening the investigation into Hillary Clinton's emails. And of course that turned out to be a complete you know, political event. The, the reopening was simply a political statement. You know, the people forget that there actually was a report that came out of it that, that exonerated the Clinton camp from everything except the normal stupid errors that people make when they deal with secure measures. Um, and, and that, yeah, that it came out in October of last year and it was largely buried. It's very hard to find. It's a public document, but the only way I've ever been able to find it is to go in through Chuck Grassley's website, which let me tell you is pretty well hidden. Um, but so that, and, and the reason that the Department of Justice has a policy of not announcing anything in the 60 days before an election is precisely to stop something from that happening. And, and actually as a historian, I think that's one of the big untold stories of 2016. Why did, did Comey do that? Comey's a straight shooter. Why did he go ahead and do that? What pressure was he under to do that? And I would like, you know, that's, that's right up there for me with finding out where Jimmy Hoffa is buried. So they can't take that sort of thing into consideration, but they also can't take into consideration what happens the day of the election. So let's say that on the day of the election, and I am making this up, but let's say on the day of the election, a hurricane hits Louisiana. Now, you can't poll for that a week ahead of time and say, this is going to keep people from Louisiana from showing up. Or let's say it's a gorgeous, sunny, terrific day in Alaska, which means that more people are going to show up. They, show up. they really can't take those sorts of things into consideration. So it's always possible that there's going to be some last monkey wrench, but it's unlikely. And, and 2016 had a lot of really, really weird stuff. So if you remember, there's about 77,000 votes that break in three key states after the polls close. And that's, you know, that's one of those things that as a, as a historian I look at and I think, you know, somebody needs to dig into how, I mean, the coincidence of that happening is really iffy, especially when you put together the fact that um, that uh, a, a journalist, and now I can't remember what his name was, did in fact leak the early results of those states to the Trump camp um, before the polls closed and was reprimanded for doing it. He was actually being considered for a position in, the, in a potential Trump administration. You know, there's a lot of things that, that made 2016 look um, unusual for, uh, for a normal, um, a normal presidential election. So I think we're all watching a lot more carefully this time around. And I, I, you know, everyone's worried, but I'm not worried like I would have been in 2017. I think a lot more people are paying a lot closer attention. And I know that both sides have really, really good legal teams right now trying to make sure yeah, that whatever right. happens is fair. Yeah. I remember in, in 2000 how frustrated I was for not having the results within at least 24 hours of the election. And it was weeks, as I recall, before we really found out what had happened. And there were a couple of false starts where, oh yeah, Gore won Florida, Gore won. And uh, no. <laughs> And I'm wondering, do you, do you feel like you're going to know the next morning who won the presidential election this year? 
I just have no idea. But I will say that it's, it, this is an easier concept for someone like me because the idea that we're gonna get results the first night is a really late 20th century thing. You know, in the, in, the, in the 19th century and in the 18th century, you really could go weeks without knowing and you could go even longer without knowing who controlled Congress, especially who controlled the Senate because until the 20th century, we don't have direct election of senators. The senators get elected through the legislature. So you gotta seat the new legislatures and then they they all got to, you know, sit around and drink and get bribed. And then they, then they pick a senator. So you could not find out who, this, who was going to control the Senate until, you know, February of the following year. And we've certainly never seen an election with such a huge, massive turnout of absentee ballots that still won't be counted until election night. But there are, I mean, the numbers are staggering. And I agree. Our, our Secretary of State here in Maine is a friend of mine, and, and we I've been sort of drilling him about this, and they're ready. I'm not at all worried about my vote in the state of Maine, which I cast in October 8th or something. But um, Cast it on my birthday, Chuck. Hey, all right. That's my sister's birthday, too. Um, so, but I mean, I'm not, I'm not really that worried about what happens here, but I'm worried about what happens in the country. And I also worry about um, rank choice voting is new in a lot of places. And the, uh, I, I have a good friend who says that Susan Collins is going to win on election night. But when the rank choice votes come, they're going to video, uh, Gideon is going to win. Uh, and that'll be a, a week or 10 days or something. And that's, uh, that's, that's a disturbing trend for those of us who want and expect instant results on everything that happens. Uh, and I, I'm wondering how the country's gonna adapt to these unknowns. I'm sure it's gonna be a big day for the press, big day for media, because they'll be selling papers and, and selling a lot of ads on TV. But I, I, I wonder about that, and, and you don't seem to be as concerned. You're, maybe you're looking at it as an uh, exercise in, <laughs> in democracy, but it's kind of scary to me. Well, so I am very concerned about that, but less because I think it's a bad idea to take the time to count the votes. I mean, I'm, I'm less concerned about a rush to count the votes. Sure, I mean, I want to know how the <laughs> election is going to turn out right now. But I don't, I don't get to know that. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I, I got to wait till they actually count the ballots. What does concern me deeply is that this is the first time in American history that we have a president who is making no pretense at all of winning the popular vote. He, the, nobody is pretending that uh, President Donald Trump is trying to win the popular vote. Everybody is very aware that he is trying to, to get reelected by making sure that Democratic votes don't get counted. And this is a big issue, regardless of whether you're Republican or a Democrat. I mean, if you, if you have a democracy and one party refuses to permit the votes of the other party to be counted, you don't have a democracy any longer. And the reason that that matters for a democracy is that you need to have two healthy parties because you need to make sure that people who disagree with the people in power have a legitimate way to say, hey, I disagree with you and I can elect enough people to rule you know, the country myself. And if they don't have that, they're not going to be continuing to um, to oppose the people in power by legitimate means, they're gonna to start to use what, you know, to violence and all sorts of other things. And I'm just talking theoretically here. The other reason you want the two healthy parties is because you wanna make sure that the party in power, Republican or Democrat, democratic has a check on on how it behaves and think about one party states like north korea or like russia there's no check on on how those people operate every once in a while they send out a member of the party to sort of you know give a public confession and and basically that's simply performative i mean that doesn't actually reform the party in power at all so it concerns me a lot that we are in a place where a president is trying to win win re-election without actually winning the popular vote or even trying to win the popular vote but rather by silencing his opponents and if you look at his language and this is where i'm going with the whole thing about the recounting or the counting um, after the the election comes in if you look at his language he is deliberately setting 
bringing up exactly what you just said. The idea that on the night of the election, it might look like Republicans have won, but as votes keep coming in, including votes from our military, by the way, those make up the bulk of the, the votes that come in after the day of the election. They must be postmarked by the election, but they come in after because they're coming a long way. Um, the, that, that as those votes are counted, that the, it's, called the, it's called the blue wave actually comes after the election when these votes come in. Um, he is trying to set up the idea that that is a flipping or a turning of the election. And you saw that last week with uh, Justice Brett Kavanaugh, who said, oh, you know, you can't do this because you're, you know, you're going to have the impression that you, you know, it's going to flip the election, to which people are pushing back and saying, no, it doesn't flip the election. It's simply counting the ballots. And one of the things that I would really emphasize for everybody is that one of the things that is fascinating for, his, for a historian about the Trump administration, but it's it's not unique to him. It's been a project on the, the GOP side for a while now, is to create, create reality. If you say it enough, it becomes true. And that's, um, you know, the, the scholars of language and rhetoric and, and politics all know about how one does that. You know, the more you repeat it, the more people think, oh yeah, it's true. And um, he is trying to make that true. He's trying to make people believe that. And it's really important to push back on that and to push back with the reality that no, you are not flipping the election if you're counting all the votes. No, you are not cheating if you are waiting for the states to certify the votes because actually it's not the media that decides who has won these elections. It is the states when they certify those votes and those votes are never certified, never. Even if it's a hundred to nothing, they are never certified on the first day. They're certified when the state has actually counted all the ballots. So that's what we should be looking for. For. If people are looking to the media, there is one thing to remember, and that is that lots of media channels, including the Fox News channel, which, as I keep saying to people, has in its terms of service that it is for entertainment purposes only, they might call elections, but they have no authority. They call elections based on what they call projections. So they could say, oh, you know, look, we've got 37% of the votes in, but the people that are left out there to, to have their votes counted are in urban areas and they tend to vote Democratic. So we're going to call this for the Democrats. That's a projection. Now they could be wrong. Everybody in Milwaukee could vote Republican. They don't know that. And so those are not real calls. Those are guesses. And they're, they're often right, but they're guesses. I mean, I could do the same thing and you'd be an idiot to believe me. Um, the one group who does have a different method than that is the Associated Press, the AP. And when the AP makes a call, they don't look at what is likely. They literally claim anyway to say, I should, that was a horrible way to put that. They, 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 their methodology is that they look at a, a race and they say, is there any possible way for the other, the other person to win? So it might be that there's only 75% of the votes in or even 51% of the votes in, but every single one of them is for the Republican candidate. If that's the case, and, and they wouldn't do it on a margin of 51%, I'm making that up, say 75%. If that's the case, even if every single other ballot came in Democratic, that Republican would still win. So they actually, they're like little mice going, what if we went down this angle? What if we went down this angle? What if we went down this angle? And when they say, no, there are no other angles by which the other person could win, then they will call a race. And it, it sounds like I'm splitting hairs there, but if you think about that, that's a really different methodology. One is cool, but likely, but really unreliable. And the other is pretty ironclad. You, are you aware of a document that was created in the first George W. Bush term? And I think that Karl Rove was heading it up. And it was a document that was eventually produced called Toward a Permanent Republican Majority. Do you know about this? I don't know about that document. I know the book from 1968. Kevin Phillips? Yeah, maybe, maybe I... Let me if my memories are mixed. You keep talking. I'm going to Google. When I was in the legislature, uh, there one of the bills that kept coming up was something called voter ID, and and on first blush it seemed like well that's not a problem. I carry a 
photo ID. It won't affect me if I go into my polling place and have to show my driver's license. I don't mind doing that. But then I realized, and people pointed out, that there are lots of places where people don't, elderly people who don't have driver's licenses anymore don't have a photo ID. And they, this was a, one of the strategies, and there were a dozen strategies for this permanent majority. Um, and, and voter suppression was one whole department, but there were several items in this whole concept of voter perception. And one of them was voter ID, where people would not be told, before, would not know beforehand that when they went to the polls, they needed an ID. So they get to the poll and they can't vote. Oh, well, if you want an ID, you have to go to the building on the other side of their city expensive transportation, take all day, da 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 and, and, and a lot of people just didn't vote, and those tended to be voters for Democrats. And this was something that I eventually, I, my initial reaction was, yeah, what's the problem with voter ID? Let's do it. And then I realized it was going to be real voter suppression in a lot of different ways. Any thoughts on that one? Well, so yeah, I love this topic, actually. So there's two things at stake. And one is exactly what you said. Um, the idea of having a national ID card is kind of a no-brainer. If you think about it, virtually every other country has one. And in fact, um, people, conservatives, and, I, and by that I don't, uh, if you ever care, I can explain to you why I differentiate conservatives from Republicans, but right. I do. Um, I work in ideas a lot and the two don't overlap right now, but conservatives really objected to the idea of a national ID card because they believed it was the overreach of the state. So that in fact, um, uh, Democrats at the time um, want, and some liberals wanted, wanted there to be a national ID and the conservatives said, not happening on our watch because that's overreach by the state. So now, of course, when you say you shouldn't have to have an ID, their reaction is, oh, you want just anyone to vote. And the answer is, you know, if we could actually give everybody a national ID, then it seems like it would make sense to have you have to be able to ident be identified at the polls. But you can't really have it both ways, because what you're saying is state legislatures get to decide what is a legitimate ID and what can what what there's there's a bunch of ways to rein that in. So for in Texas, for example, you can use your hunting license, but you can't use your student ID card. Um, that's just not considered something that's a legitimate ID. Well, you can see right there what's happening. Similarly, the one that just, just frosts my shorts is that in certain times in Texas, you have been uh, required to have your name exactly match your ID, which again, no brainer, right? Although lots of us can't remember if we use our middle names or not, but not necessarily a huge deal. Um, but whose name changes a lot? Women's because women get divorced and married and they change their names and that means that they can't vote based on their former ID and you say, well, they should get their acts together and get the new ID. Well, yeah, it's fairly expensive in Texas to get a new ID. But the story behind how that happened is I think really instructive because we get the Republican focus on um, what they called voter integrity, if you remember that, in 1986. And before the midterms of 86, 1986. And the reason that they did that was because we tend to forget it now, you know, the Laust and the hagiography of the past, but the Republican tax cuts of the Reagan years were not popular. I mean, they, they in, 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 in like popular media, they made it sound like they were popular. They were not popular. People did not think trickle-down economics was going to work. And if you recall, after the initial Reagan tax cut, the economy went into the toilet, not entirely because of those tax cuts, although that had a big part, a, big, a lot to do with it. But people were not at all convinced that this whole tax cut thing was going to work. So when they go to make the, the 86 tax cuts, which is the other major round of tax cuts during the Reagan years, when they do that, the Republicans recognize that they've got a real problem for the midterms. And they actually go on this effort to have what they call voter integrity. And we have the memos from that. There was a lawsuit about those. And in the memos, there are people from the Republican National Committee who are saying, listen, if we do this, we think we can knock a significant number of Black people off the voting rolls. And that means we're going to keep Republicans in power. And that that idea of focusing on fraud then gets picked up in the 1990s, in the early 1990s. There's a, there's a little 
place in between as well that I'm not going to go into because it's a little bit in the weeds, unlike everything else I'm talking about. But in 1993, with the motor voter law under Clinton, the Republicans start to insist that the, the Democrats are forcing, you know, forcing voters who shouldn't be voting into the system. Now, think about that. Should people vote or not? You know, it's a democracy. Yes, they should vote. But the motor voter law encourages people to sign up for registration when they register to their cars, but also you can register in places like welfare offices. So there was this idea that somehow the Democrats were packing the vote. And after that, the Republicans, especially under Newt Gingrich, begin to say that every time a Republic, I'm sorry, a Democrat wins, they're only winning because of voter fraud. Now there is, again, for the millionth time, you are far more likely to get hit by lightning than for there to be voter fraud. But uh, it, it, it's incredibly rare and it's usually accidental. You know, somebody doesn't recognize that they're registered in one place and they vote in another. Or, you know, there's, there's all kinds of, of, you know, not all kinds of, there are few accidents every year, but it is infinitesimal. But during, you may or may not remember, during the Gingrich years, there were two cases that they made a point of, one in the Senate and one in the House, where in both, case, women, in both cases women had been elected, Democratic women had been elected, and the Republicans who controlled both the House and the Senate at that time started investigations claiming that they had been fraudulently elected. And they kept those elections going all year. So they're out in front of the cameras all year going, hey, where there's fraud here, there's there wasn't. And at the end of the at the end of the day, the in the 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 investigations close and they say, well, we couldn't prove it because they hid the evidence, but we know it was there. And here's what I was talking about, about creating your own reality. You're seeing it on the news every single night. You know, it's, it's every single, and people think, oh my God, we've got voter fraud. So what happens on the heels of that is really interesting because at the end of the 1990s, there is a, a, a mayoral race in Miami, Florida. And there aren't actually even any Democrats in it. There's a Republican and an independent. They're both Cuban Americans, as I recall. And the thing is just laced with fraud on both sides. Lots of people go to jail. And that really adds teeth in Florida to the idea of voter fraud. And as I say, nobody argued that that election was not corrupt. It just was, but that's about Florida really. It's not about national politics. And on the heels of that, the Florida legislature in 1998 puts into practice uh, or, or writes a voter ID law. And li listen to that date, 1998. And as it is implemented, um, what, it's, it's interesting, I actually have gotten um, communications from people who were on the team implementing it. And they identified on the voter rolls, people that whose names didn't match or whatever, it was it was people that they should have reached out to, but instead all those people got purged and a government investigation after the 2000 election from the government, not you know, from a partisan group one side or the other, estimated that as many as 100,000 voters got kicked off the Florida right. voting rolls. And most of them, the, the guess is, because it can, you, you don't know who, was, who isn't there any longer, considering where they came from, it looks like they were primarily Democrats. All right, now what happens in 2000? The election comes down to Florida. At the end of the day, it comes down to 327 voters. And again, that was the days of the hanging chads and the butterfly ballot, which is enormously confusing. And you look at that and you just say, you know, I didn't pay a lot of attention to that when I was living through it. And when I just wrote a, a book before this one on, um, on, uh, on the Republican Party, and I look at that election and I think, that's, that's, that's where they figured it worked. And do you know who went down to stop the recounting of those ballots? Because when they recounted them, of course, Gore was going ahead. You know who was, uh, was part of the recount process? James Baker. James Baker, but you're aiming way too high. Roger Stone. <laughs> of course. Roger Stone who did that. And he gave, well, he, if anybody's interested, he gave a number of interviews to the Miami Herald about that. They had a whole beat on Roger Stone in the 19 aughts, I think it was. And he talks about it and he's like, you know, that's why I love Nixon. You know, that Gore was all high-minded about protecting democracy and we were just out for the kill and that's how you got to run politics. Well, Professor Heather Cox Richardson, who knew we could go on and on about this? We have run right out of time, but I really want to thank you for being on this show and for joining us. And you're fascinating and smart. And I hope we get to talk again. Oh, it's such a pleasure. Thank you so much.